all and welcome back. This is part two of Nova's Rebuild. Oh no! Nova! I've made a few changes since the last time. There's a conventional floppy drive and I got around to putting the SD card adapter in the front. I also replaced both optical drives as neither one worked. The video is now a GeForce 4MX, as I ran a similar card back in the day. There's also a Sound Blaster Live, as the Monster Sound card is kaput. I went ahead and sped up the video of the Captain replacing a few capacitors for me. He's a little better at the surface mount repairs than I am. wonder how many more motherboards he'll repair for me. <laughs> We did end up doing the smoke test off camera. Thankfully, everything was good. Okay, now I made a decision on which OS I shall use, and it is Windows 2000. The original build started with Windows 98 using the 98 Lite installer from LightPC.net. However, I abandoned that around early 2003 and used Windows 2000 until it was no longer supported. In one of my classic videos, I did restore a Ghost backup that had 98 Lite on it. However, I feel Windows 2000 is more appropriate for this build, concerning the applications I'm going to run. I preferred Windows 2000 and Linux as I resisted adopting Windows XP due to its mandatory product activation. At the time, I believed that there were only a fixed number of activations Microsoft would honor, and furthermore, I believed that Microsoft would also one day no longer honor any activations regardless of your legitimacy status. I found these terms unfair and unacceptable, as the majority of issues with Windows were best resolved by wiping and reloading. Long before it was common to have a restore point, or an easy bare metal recovery option. In my IT career, thankfully I found that this is not the case, as I've always been able to activate older products as long as the license was valid. Now that's possible that could change in the future, so who knows. I do have another build planned with similar vintage hardware, where I'll explore Windows 98 and Windows 98 Lite and show you the differences. I personally don't like Windows 98 all that much due to a bad first impressions and it was a painful lesson about the importance of regular backups. Still, I personally prefer Windows 95 OSR2 as both have the same underlying version of MS-DOS, whereas retail Windows 95 I understand was version 7 and Windows Millennium being version 8, but who really ran that? Come on. I can make that the subject of a future video if anyone's interested. Let me know in the comments, and while you're at it, please subscribe. I ask reluctantly because I too find other channels' requests to do so a bit annoying myself, but this channel is largely for fun, and let me know. You can always let me know what's going on. Anyways, back to Windows 2000. You'll understand if I don't share my product key. So I find it interesting that Windows 2000 may have been the first version that does not allow you to pick what components are installed. It just has its own list. And I believe Windows XP largely is the same. There are applications you can use to change what is installed by default but those options aren't given here. Both Windows 95 and Windows 98, and I believe even Windows NT 4.0, had all offered an option to change what components are installed at this stage. Registering components? Registering for what? The draft? Save settings. Hmm. Only until it mangles them again. I'm not sarcastic, am I? By the way, the footage is sped up. Using an SD card was not any faster than an IDE drive was back in the day. 
although I did not experience nearly as much trouble as Duraga 1 did with his Windows 2000 installation on an SD card. Alright, reboot time. Yep, time to set up an account. Fun. I think we'll just go with everybody's favorite of administrator. Because, you know, that's always the most secure way to go. Alright, default desktop. Let me turn this off. Stupid. Okay, and goodbye balloon. Alright, and let's check on the device manager. Uh, where did I put it? Okay. Yeah. Come on. Right, hardware, and, uh, okay. And here we are. Looks like it didn't identify the Ethernet controller or the video. Okay. I think we'll just close all this for just a moment. Let's install the service pack. Already in progress. Sorry. Quick reboot to install DirectX 9. Remember when you used to have to install these things by hand? Or when you were prompted? <laughs> Bet you're glad those days are over. And another reboot. Now for the NVIDIA drivers. It was interesting back in the day when you had the TNT and other similar cards, the drivers were called Detonator kind of miss when they used to do things like that. I think this one was called Forceware and not sure what they're up to today, but oh well, bygone days. Another quick reboot and now the desktop's pretty again. Okay, now time to install the motherboard specific drivers. Uh, thankfully, via, via, however you pronounce it, doesn't matter. They make a package here called the 4-in-1 Hyperion Pack, or however the name goes. Anyways, this is what you need if you have a via-based motherboard in an old as dirt operating system. Another reboot. <laughs> Look at that, the sound decided it wanted to work. Let's see if we can get the ethernet going now. I'll point out that this is a Linksys LNE 100TX card, just like the other build. However, this one's an earlier revision, so I'm gonna have to use a slightly different driver. This particular hardware revision is revision 2.0. I also have versions 4, 4.1, I believe it said, and also version 5. I found that the drivers for 4 and 5 will work, but not with this earlier revision. So just a note if you run into that yourself. Here I'm going to copy the contents of the original disk. This way I always have them handy. Windows Vista and newer already has this ready to go. However, those who've worked with Windows XP and back have realized the frustration of having to dig for a disk when prompted. This will help alleviate that to some degree. Alright, here's an older release of Adobe Reader. You never know when you're going to have to refer to a PDF, even on something as dirt old as this. The footage is sped up here, but this still feels like it takes forever, especially for what the application does. And Adobe Reader DC is not any better. Ah, Blender. Kinda wish I learned to use this back in the day. At least I can run it now. Yeah, 
And of course, here's CDEX. This was very helpful back in the day when ripping CDs. I preferred going over this method rather than using a program like iTunes. And now to install an old release of Firefox. Hey, everyone remember when this was the big thing before Chrome came along. I actually used to use this when it was still called Phoenix in a much, much earlier release. My, how time flies. And now C Cleaner. Although I recall when this used to be called Crap Cleaner. Ah, now time for a twist. I'm going to install Star Office instead of Microsoft Office. For a time, this was offered for free from Sun Microsystems after they had acquired the previous company whose name escapes me at the moment. Yes, I know, this version of Java is way obsolete and insecure. Rest easy, this is just to placate up this installation of Star Office. And this machine won't be going online or doing any other daily service. This is just for fun offline. I find it amusing how this installer resembles the Windows 98 installer, albeit with a different color scheme. Ah, Tweak UI and Throb Off. Nathan Laneback made some registry things you can insert to make the interface a bit more sane. Tweak UI is not his, of course. Now Cool 3D, a handy program for creating 3D text with different effects and textures. I'll be putting on some more graphics applications momentarily. Such as, we're going to put this installer for the ULEAD Photo Explorer up here. And then, why not, while we're here, let's install the Visual Basic Runtime. Some program's going to need that. Now, this brings me to one of my gripes with Windows 2000 and later, is I cannot install Windows Media Player 6, which I feel is the better version. Oh, in order to get better functionality, I'll have to use an older version of Media Player Classic, but it's not quite the same as using this. Thankfully, there's Winamp and other media players to help fill the gap. Ah, good old WSFTP, before there was FileZilla. I think I'm pretty much wrapped up here. Let me close this, and I'll pop something into the drive. Photo Impact 5 was my favorite photo editing program of all time. Sorry, I'm not going to show my CD key. It's a shame it won't run on modern computers, and that the company you lead was bought out by Corel only to be shut down. There was another variant out there called Photo Impact Pro. I'm not certain of what makes it different. Maybe one of these days I'll acquire a copy and we'll see what the differences are. Alright, installation is finished up, and let's go ahead and get that ULEAD Photo Explorer now. Little known thing, if you have Photo Impact installed, the installer here will give you the full version. Yay! This was way more handy than using the Windows Explorer prior to Windows XP. Okay, my second most used application, should be no surprise. This is Adobe Photoshop 5 LE. Now, it's my understanding that limited edition in this case means this is cost reduced, but I could be wrong. I just recalled not seeing as many plugins and all the other things from version 4. Otherwise, it does the same job. I'll admit that the one thing that Photo Impact lacks is decent layering whereas Photoshop and then later GIMP are absolutely great at it. Alright, this pretty much wraps up most of the programs I'm going to put in. Next time we're going to start doing some games, more specifically the stuff that ran during this era.
such as Unreal Tournament once again.